Having a sample API is a useful tool when learning web development because it gives you something to test your front end against. In this course, we are building a sample API that can be used both locally and via the web. Along the way, we are learning how to build and deploy a minimal API in C Sharp. When we're done, we'll have built an API with sample data that is documented, has health checks, simulates slowdowns and errors, and is deployed both as a Docker container as well as a web application on a virtual private server. The end result will be a tool you can use in testing for your own apps. In this lesson, we're going to implement slowdowns and error codes so your app can test for slow APIs and unexpected errors. Let's jump right in, and we're going to start off by adding a delay to our endpoints, specifically just our course endpoints. And I don't think we need to add a delay to all of our endpoints, but we'll probably add it just, just on the safe side. All right, so I'm going to add the load all courses. I'm going to add one more thing here. I'm going to say int, say a nullable int, and it's going to be called delay. I have to add the comma afterwards. There we go. So we're going to add a delay as a possible option to this load all courses. We'll do the same thing again for this one as well, but um, we don't have to, but I'm going to just to be on the completionist side. That way, if you want to test a load one record, but load it slowly, you could do so. So how do we test for or how we say, yes, delay this. What we're going to do is we're going to change the, the type of um, call we have. We actually come up here to um, this I result and say public, um, or I'm sorry, private static async. And it's going to be task of I result. And it says I result. So, we have to change this over because of the fact that we're going to do a task dot delay. So down here, we're going to say if delay is not null, and then we're going to have a maximum delay. So I'm going to say max delay of five minutes, which is going to be 300,000 milliseconds. And we're going to say if delay is greater than 300,000, there we go, then delay equals 300,000. And this just makes sure that we don't have some unreasonable time passed in that's essentially forever. We don't want our application waiting forever. We're going to say await task.delay, and we have to say if we say to just delay, it's going to error as because or have an error because it's a nullable integer. We've already proven that it's not null. Therefore, we can just say it's an integer. So this will delay the processing of our, our API call by whatever number we pass in. And this is an, a milliseconds. So a delay is in milliseconds. So we'll await that delay for as long as that timer says before we return the results. Let's see us in action. So we're going to run this and we'll simulate a decent size delay. Uh, we're not going to simulate five minutes. That's way too long. But let's zoom out here. Remember that we added the um, the I, the option to both we only actually implemented it on the, the full slash courses. So let's add delay here. I don't know, let's let's add uh, 5,000 milliseconds. So that'd be five seconds. So we hit send and we wait and we wait and we wait. And then we get the results back and notice it took five seconds to call this up here, five seconds but we got the results back. So we can simulate now a delay. So if we said, you know what, let's do, uh, let's do 500. So it's faster, 507 milliseconds. Um, notice we're not ever gonna get just 500 
because of the fact it does take some time to process the API, in this case, seven milliseconds. But the other 500 is the waiting. So it's not gonna be, you're not dialing an exact number here. You're just saying at least this long. So that's how we add delay to our calls. Let's do the same thing down below. So let's copy this code and then we will come down here. Um, let's add the delay before we add the um, not found because we still want to delay even if we um, ask for an invalid record. So let's make this method async. I just use the control dot to do that. And now we have our delay in place. We, we did add the delay to the uh, parameters. So now we can delay the single record as well. Let's verify that works. Nope, it does not work. Um, the name load course by ID does not exist. Okay, so I broke something when I did this. Load course by ID. Load course by ID async. Aha. So it added async on our method name, um, which I don't know what we need to do, um, or we need to do it for both of these. Um, let's do it for both of them. That way we are consistent here with our naming. And we do say that, yes, they are async methods, just in case you're calling them from somewhere else. You probably shouldn't be, but, um, well, they're privates, so you probably won't be, but we are being consistent saying they are async methods. Now let's run this and see if we can't um, call our API, the just the return one value. So let's hit test. So we're gonna return the value of eight and we are going to say the delay is going to be uh, 700 milliseconds. We hit send, there we go. Our total time was 722 milliseconds and we get back our Postman clone app course. So we now have a delay in this call as well. If we took that off and hit send, we have a bad request. Now let's first, let's make sure that it's not an API issue or an endpoint issue by just saying, you know what, let's pass in the value here of uh, nine. Oops, not in cookies, um, in ID. There we go. And that works without any delay. If we add a 50 second delay, 50 millisecond delay, that works. If we go back to zero and hit send, we get an error here. My guess is if I hit clear, um, and hit send, it works. So it probably is just the fact that we cleared out a value here um, and that didn't register as actually being null. So it caused a bit of an issue. So it's just more of a UI issue that you probably won't experience if you're if you're um, testing this out. You probably wouldn't put a value in and then clear it back out. So I think we're fine. Um, if you want to, it'll come back if you say delay uh, 45 and hit send, then it delays it, um, by 45 milliseconds. You know, if, if we say, uh, 450, then it delays by 450 milliseconds. So we're good there. Um, just know that's kind of a quirk of the UI. It's not actually a bug in our code. Okay. So we've added a delay to our calls, our kind of our real calls. We're not, we're not delaying our other calls. So now let's add an endpoint that will return whatever error we want it to. Now, this specific endpoint down here, the load course by ID async, will return you a 404 if you pass in a, uh, a record that's not been found, all right? So um, if it doesn't find a record, it's gonna give you a 404, but that's about it. Like, it's not like, you can get other error codes based upon that. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go to the root endpoint just to copy this pattern here. Again, patterns are great. And now we're going to create a new endpoint set. It's called error endpoints. Now this will only have 
one method in it or one endpoint in it. Whoops, wrong one. Uh, there we go. And that's going to be our endpoint for um, our errors. So add error endpoints. And we'll have one map get, and that will say slash error, and then say slash code. Um, and then the code and create braces. So the code is going to be an integer. And instead of hello world, we're going to do our curly braces. And inside our curly braces, we're going to return code. And we'll do a switch statement again. I'm sorry, a switch expression. And in here, we're going to say if it's 400, then we want to say results dot bad request. And if it's a 401, we want to say results dot unauthorized. And then we also want to say if it's a 403, we want to say results dot forbid. And if it's a 404, we want to say results dot not found. And if it's anything else, I mean, you want a more specialized error code, one that we didn't list here specifically, results dot status code and pass in the code. And I'll return that specific error for you, that code for you. Okay, so what this does is we have just one map get um, and this is going to return for us the error that you ask for. Now you mark this class as static. And then we need to add our error endpoints to program.cs. So add root endpoints, app.add error endpoints. There we go. Add error endpoints. And that's it. We now have error handling. So let's run this. And we're going to go to our error endpoint. And we're going to say, let's run that. So we're going to pass in a 400 error. We get back bad request, 400. What if we said 403? We're getting back um, internal server error. That's not right, probably. Uh, 401. 401 is unauthorized. How about 404? 404 not found. How about we want a 301, which is a redirect? 301 move permanently. So it looks like we've got a error set that's actually working. 405 method not allowed. So whatever we pass in, we get that type of error back. So again, this is for testing purposes where we say, hey, we want to see what happens when our application encounters a specific type of error. Well, we can call this slash error and pass in the code you want to see and get back or see the results of what our application does when we get that specific type of error. Or call, like if you get a 301 or a, you know, uh, a 201, et cetera. We can pass in whatever we want and get back that specific call. Now, I probably could have called it um, HTTP code or something like that because you could get a non-error back, like a 301 or, or a 201. Um, but typically, we'll pass in error codes. This. So let's just call it slash error. And that's it. That's how we add error checking or error systems to our code so that we can test for the different states of an API through the errors. So now we have slowdowns and errors in our API intentionally so that we can test these various states and see how our systems will react to an API that's acting like this. Now that's a functionality I wanted to see in my application, in my test or sample API. I wanted to see this working with slowdowns and errors and health checks and different endpoints and all these different things you've implemented in this API. There's more to add. We can do things like adding authentication authorization and other types of endpoints. For example, having a 
a put patch and delete that would just, I guess, return either a specific value back or or something else. We'll, we'll work on that probably in the future. Um, once we figure out exactly what you want to return from those, if it's just a 200 success or if it's something more. But next up, what we're going to do is we're going to put this in a Docker container. Now, why, why a Docker container? Why a container? Um, the reason why is because you'll be able to download this image using Docker desktop or whatever uh, containers tool you use locally. You can download this and run this API locally in a container. That way it's self-contained. It's, you know, one line of code or one line of, of text. And you say, run this thing and it will run in Docker for you. So we're going to do that in the next lesson, including putting it up into the Docker hub. But until then, thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.